If you are trying to differentiate yourself, you have to be very, very careful not to become generic in the minds of the customer. Otherwise, you're going to have a hard time getting them to choose you and you're only going to be able to compete on convenience or price. If you want to be able to compete on quality and on difference, then you have to be known as the podcast host who, the marketer who, the shoe company that, right? So if you want to be a, you know, you're a company like a Bombas that makes socks, you're the company whose socks really never wear holes in the heels, no matter how much people wear them. And they're really comfy and they feel like a hug on your feet and... Every time somebody buys a pair of socks from you, you donate a pair of socks to someone who needs them. That's being known for something different. Does the return on investment that your marketing campaigns generate embarrass you? Discover how the marketing campaigns of some business owners who know next to nothing about marketing almost always produce huge returns for their business. I'm Ken Newhouse. Building a profitable business isn't only about generating leads and driving sales. It's about who we are and what we're made of. It's about finding the most effective methods to persuade, inspire, and ignite the imagination of others so you can succeed in business. If you're a member of the new breed of entrepreneur, I invite you to join the quest as we reveal the newest and most effective methods you can use to get clients now. Does your business marketing strategy function more like a frenzied mess than an organized campaign that consistently generates a positive return on your investment? Does it feel like your business is simply surviving because you haven't been able to find marketing strategies that magnetically attract perfect prospects into your business? Have you been looking for new, more powerful and effective methods for bringing new clients into your business month in and month out? You know, I am amazed at the number of people in 2020 that market their businesses in a frenzied, unorganized and unstructured approach, always chasing that next client, unable to generate consistent growth because they haven't figured out how to market their business effectively. It's an approach to marketing that is so common among non-marketing business owners as to be nearly universal. And for most business owners, it's all they've ever known. But I've got some good news for you because there's a better way. And on today's show, best-selling author and CEO of Silver Tree Communications, Kate Colbert, is going to reveal her most effective methods so you can create marketing campaigns that consistently bring new clients into your business by teaching you how to think like a marketer. Colbert's book, Think Like a Marketer, is a top-selling book on Amazon that offers a fresh new approach to a new, more powerful, and lasting way of doing business. An approach that involves a sometimes subtle but always impactful shift in mindset. If your business is like most others, it's driven by a sales mindset. And a sales mindset is not the same as a marketing mindset. Few companies are truly marketing-driven, and as you're about to discover, Colbert believes that that's what's holding many businesses back from becoming and remaining consistently profitable. You know, most business owners and leaders, regardless of their company size or the industry they serve, tend to think of marketing as a functional area or a cost center or, in only the very best of cases, a strategic driver of business. But most of these professionals still think of marketing in terms of departments, agencies, campaigns, and projects. Listen, here's the truth that no one is speaking. What you need more than a great marketing director or a great marketing agency is the right marketing mindset because it's the only way to achieve profitable, sustainable growth for your business. Hi, I'm Ken Newhouse, and I want to welcome you to episode 379 of the Get Clients Now podcast. I've been a direct response marketer and copywriter for the last 23 years, and I've seen literally dozens and dozens and dozens of clients go from frustration and struggle to success, growth, and enormous levels of profit when they finally started to think like a marketer. Their shift in perspective had a significant impact on their marketing strategy's effectiveness, their business, and their bank account, and it can do the same for you. And that's why I'm absolutely thrilled to have Kate Colbert as our guest on today's show. So if you're ready to learn how to think like a marketer, and if you're ready to totally transform your marketing so it consistently brings high-value new clients into your business where they are predisposed to say yes to your recommendations and give you money, let's go ahead and welcome Kate Colbert onto the show. How you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of your mission to help others uh, sort of persuade, inspire, um, ignite. I'm so thrilled to be here. You know, Kate, like myself, you're in recovery still. Your recovery has been a, uh, a little longer than mine, but uh, we've both gone through that. It was pretty harsh. But Kate, I'm glad you're able to be on the show with us today. If you could take a minute or two, I think a lot of our listeners probably know who you are. But for the listener who may not know who you are, 
kind of bring us up to speed on who you are and set the stage for the interview that we're going to do today on the show? Great. Now, I'm happy to give you a little bit of backstory. So I think what people know most about me these days is my expertise in helping organizations tell meaningful stories about their companies or their products or their services. I'm a brand storyteller who really cares about the data. So people come to me for data-driven differentiation, not just pretty brochures or cool headlines for billboards, but to really understand what makes their businesses tick and what makes them meaningfully different so that they can compete in a sustainable way. And for your listeners, so that they can understand how to find more clients and then keep them for the long haul and how to listen to them better. How I came to be here... So my background was not originally in marketing at all. We kind of joke around here a little bit that I have four degrees, none of which are in marketing. And I run a marketing company and wrote a book called Think Like a Marketer, which just is sort of goes to prove that when you have an aptitude or or a passion, you will find your way to it one way or the other. I started out actually as a storyteller, as a writer. So I fell in love with writing as a little kid started writing poetry and short stories when I was probably six. And after high school, went off to college to study English and went straight to grad school to study comparative literature and composition theory and was going to be an English professor forever and ever. Amen. And I did that for a little while and quickly discovered that while I loved teaching other people how to write, I didn't love doing it as much as I loved writing. So I took a little career detour, went into the magazine publishing industry, wrote for a technical magazine back when cell phones were just starting to get smaller and more technical. And so I wrote in the tech field as one of the only women covering that industry and then went on to run marketing departments in various kinds of organizations, including a couple of colleges and universities, and then decided to go off on my own and tell strategic brand stories and make cash registers ring for organizations in a variety of industries. And here we are today. And so here we are today. And so as I mentioned earlier, just a few seconds ago, you have one of the hottest selling marketing books on Amazon today. And in fact, if I understand correctly, it's created, I would say an overabundance of new opportunities for you. And so what I want to know is, how do you deal with a fantastic dilemma like that? So you got all these different things as a result of writing this awesome book. You have this rush of people coming to talk to you, wanting you to speak. They want to become clients. How do you deal with a fantastic dilemma like that? Yeah, first of all, yeah, it is a fantastic dilemma, but it is a dilemma. So I think that a lot of your listeners probably have maybe too much business or too much of a sense of busyness, working too many hours, too many days a week but maybe not as profitably as they would like, or maybe not working with the customers that really energize them. So I have had to spend some time really soul searching and being strategic these last couple of years and focusing on exactly what I tell my readers and my clients to focus on. Understanding what it is that I do and for whom and why, who the ideal customer is for me, and what I don't do. So The challenge, I think, of having sort of a broad marketing background as I do and having served people in everything from we need a marketing strategy to we need to do a market research project to can you write the scripts for our radio commercials is understanding not just that I could say yes and that I know how to do those things, but figuring out where the right fit is. And so this past year, I would say I probably say no to more than 50% of the opportunities that come our way. And that did not come naturally to me. But I have come to understand that if somebody comes to me and they want me to design their website, for example, and it's something we've done a zillion times for clients, that's not what we're most passionate about around here. And we're really about the data, about the market research, about the storytelling, about the business strategy. And that sort of tactical work, while we do it well, a lot of people do it well. And those clients will actually be better served by someone else if they go to somebody who lives and breathes every morning to get up to design another website. And so I have had to focus on the fact that saying no is not letting someone down. Saying no is opening a new door for somebody to find the right fit for them. So 
yes, it's been an interesting challenge. And as somebody who used to be a bit of a workaholic herself, it's been a challenge for me to not feel guilty in walking away. But I can promise you this. I think that what I have discovered, and I think is the case for everyone, is workload or sort of a desk. I like to think of it as a tarmac at an airport. And if it's cluttered with all kinds of airplanes, all kinds of projects sort of sitting there that need your attention that you're behind schedule on, nothing can land. So no cool new stuff can come in and nothing can take off. So nothing gets finished either. And so you have to create that space. You cannot have eight hours of meetings a day. You cannot be doing the kind of travel that I used to do, 16 airplanes in 14 days kind of stuff. It becomes too much and it takes you away from what you do best. So now I focus on having an absolute blast and making an impact for my clients on doing what I do best and only what I do best. You know, it's been said that it's borderline unethical to actually take a new client on, even if you know you could do a fabulous job for them, even if you know you could do a better job than anybody else, if you're not fully engaged and all in and totally passionate and in love with the project that you have, you're doing yourself a disservice and I think you're doing your client a disservice. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but if you want to give me a response to that quickly, then I want to yeah. uh, dive into another thought that I had. Absolutely. You, and you do have to trust your gut. So my litmus test for that is when I talk to somebody or I think about a new project or an opportunity comes my way, when I get off that initial phone call, I ask myself, after that call, am I feeling energized or depleted? And I usually can answer that really clearly. Or am I feeling really, really excited and confident? Or do I have some misgivings? So I can think of several clients throughout my career who wasn't sure about at first, who I even picked up the phone and called other people who they'd worked with and said, is this person going to be really high maintenance? Or is this project going to be okay? Or I've heard this company is dealing with a bit of scandal. You know, I'm going to regret working with these folks. I used to rely on other people to reassure me that this was going to be a great client. It was going to be a great project. And they were always wrong. If my gut feeling was, I'm not sure, I should have listened to that. And I made some big mistakes in that earlier in my business. But now that we're 18 years in, I think I have uh, a, a better, uh, more trustworthy gut when it comes to that kind of stuff. So you must have started marketing when you were 12 because you look like you're 30, maybe 32. So anyway. Well, thank you. <laughs> so the title of your book is Think Like a Marketer. That's not the entire title of the book, but that's like the big title of the book. So my question would be, what is the motivation or what is the reason behind the importance the tremendous importance of a business owner. I don't care if they're a professional, like a dentist, a chiropractor, attorney, whatever it may be, maybe brick and mortar, maybe they're an online marketer, it doesn't matter. Why is it critical to their success, especially in the midst of COVID, to think like a marketer? So thinking like a marketer, from my perspective, really involves five key mindset shifts. And I'll walk you through that in a moment. But ultimately, being a leader is about making decisions. It's about deciding where to spend the money. It's about deciding where to spend the effort. It's about deciding whether to scale up your staffing or cut back or focus, whether to say yes or no to clients. And all of those decisions, if you don't have some sort of governor or litmus test or filters to be able to guide you in those decisions, those decisions, no matter how smart you are, can become pretty haphazard. I have found over the years as I've been consulting with brands, big and small, nonprofit, for-profit, across a variety of industries, that when I help them understand, here's how a marketer would think about that. Here's how a marketer would put the customer interest first. Here's how a marketer would think about the data in making this decision. Suddenly, those individuals and those organizations are making better decisions. So it at the end of the day, it's not about trying to become a marketer, right? So if you're a chiropractor, you're the CFO of a company, you're an attorney, whatever it is you do, keep doing that and keep being awesome at that. But having the ability to think like a marketer will help you generate more profitable results and longer term success going forward. That's awesome. So I'm going to dive into the book, different parts of the book. You know, when we originally talked, I really wanted to talk about story, but I've been led in a different direction just by some of the things that came up. So one of the sections that really stuck out to me is being known for something. You talked about being known for something. So what are two or three really important reasons why? Again, I'm going to go back to COVID, a lot more competition, actually less competition because people have gone out of business. But at the same time, businesses are not as quick to want to spend money, business owners 
you can still get new clients, but what are two or three really important reasons that we need to be quote unquote known for something? So nobody spends real money on a commodity. If you could liken yourself or your business to a five pound bag of flour, right? You're standing in the grocery store and you're trying to buy flour or sugar. You probably don't have a strong preference for one brand over the other. You're going to go with, you know, what's packaging sort of looks like it's reputable enough that there's, it's probably edible and whatever's on sale. You don't want to find yourself in that position unless you happen to be a massive organization that sells flour or sugar, right? But if you are trying to differentiate yourself, you have to be very, very careful not to become generic in the minds of the customer. Otherwise, you're going to have a hard time getting them to choose you and you're only going to be able to compete on convenience or price. If you want to be able to compete on quality and on difference, then you have to be known as the podcast host who the marketer who, the shoe company that, right? So if you want to be a, you know, you're a company like a Bombas and make socks, you're the company whose socks really never wear holes in the heels, no matter how much people wear them. And they're really comfy and they feel like a hug on your feet. And every time somebody buys a pair of socks from you, you donate a pair of socks to someone who needs them. That's being known for something different. So We've all been to a zillion conferences and we've met a zillion people and handed off a zillion business cards and we get home and we're looking through those cards and it's really easy to say, I don't really remember this woman or this man, like I sort of vaguely. People who are really known and seen for something, you'll remember when you grab that card and the card may do something actually in terms of its design or what it says to help you remind that, but you're going to say, oh yeah, 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 that's the consultant who doesn't have upfront fees, but who actually takes a cut on the back end and guarantees the success of his services. Or that's the consultant who, or that's the dentist who specializes in working with patients who have fear of the dentist. Or that's the church for people who hate going to church. So it really is, the world is just so cluttered with so many messages and so much opportunity and information at your fingertips you cannot afford not to be differentiated in a meaningful way today. Just for the record, I love going to church. I love the Bible. And I know that some people hate going to church because of reasons we don't need to discuss. But um, yeah, it's not about what you do. It's about who you know. But anyway, you talk in the book, you know, we talked about, you just mentioned being a company that sells flour or sugar, like generically. So now that we're in Whole Foods, we're in the supermarket, I'm going to take the direction with this next question and talk about the last time I was in Whole Foods, I noticed that the lady that stands there with the cheese or the wine or the crackers or the little salamis or whatever, the salmon or whatever it is, she's no longer there. And I guess it's because of COVID. But what those ladies do is they offer a form of sampling. But as it relates to our business, and again, it doesn't matter what kind of business you have. In the book, you talk about sampling. So if you could tell us what sampling is, you know, in a very brief description, but then I want you to transition from that and tell me what you think is the hottest most effective strategy of sampling that we can use in our business today? One that's maybe universal because every business is probably different, obviously. But if there was one generic one that sticks out like, wham, that one's awesome. What would that sampling strategy be? Great. So sampling essentially is exactly what you're talking about. It's the person who's giving out the taste of a smoothie or the bagel bite at the grocery store. And we're not seeing a whole lot of that right now because of COVID. But it really is. It's about letting the customer try your product or service for free in a very sort of non-committal way, sometimes even without knowing how to follow up with them. They don't have to give their name or anything. And they get to decide whether or not they love you. And they get to decide whether or not they want to buy a whole box of Bagel Bites. So they get to decide whether or not they want to hire you as an executive coach or hire you for your services based on your sample. Sampling is not something that only works in the grocery store. And it's not something that only works for physical consumer packaged good products. In fact, I think that sampling in the business to business professional services space is one of the most underutilized marketing tools available to us. And it's often free. So for example, your podcast is a really great way for listeners to sample your expertise. So if they're thinking about buying one of your books, or they're thinking about hiring you for some consulting or taking one of your webinars, they get to listen to you interact with your guests and get a sense of your expertise, your style, your savvy, your approachableness. That's a sample. If business professionals like many of those who are listening to this episode 
have really great insights or unique frameworks or interesting ways to think about the work that they do, if they write blog posts and put them on their website or on LinkedIn and put those articles up somewhere, if they do Facebook Live videos, if they provide interesting insights on their social media channels, that's sampling. I think one of the best things, I think blogging is by far the easiest sort of entrance into sampling in the business to business world. But also be thinking about how can you provide a free assessment, a free coaching experience, a consultation. So if you're looking to gain new clients or get more share of wallet from your existing clients and you have something new that you can do for them. So you're an attorney and you've just started offering, you know, estate planning services and you say to your existing clients, could we schedule some time? I'd love to give you just 30 minutes to give you kind of an overview of how estate planning works and to answer any questions you have about that. And there's no cost, right? That's a sample of your services. So I'm seeing more and more businesses doing really smart assessments online. So collecting names and email addresses and asking a few questions, doing a little bit of a sort of a quiz to give you some information up front. There are a lot of ways to do it. And those digital ways are a great way to do it in scale or a podcast or blogs can be a really great way to do it in scale. But if you do very high touch personal work like executive coaching, give away your first session for free, do you know some sort of 45 minute consultation for free. I believe that no matter what it is you sell or who you sell it to, there is a sampling strategy for you. And if you're not giving away something, it's going to be harder to sell everything else. Absolutely. And so something I might just chime in there real quick, really doesn't matter what your business is, offer something, look at it as an investment in marketing. So instead of paying $500 on Facebook ads, and by the way, Facebook ads are a great way to get traffic. But as an example, invest something that's valued at $500 or $100 or whatever it might be. It could even be a free lead magnet, a PDF. There are a million different things. And Kate goes over these in depth in the book. So Kate, you've got, as I mentioned before, one of the hottest selling marketing books on Amazon. Certainly something I would be very proud of, something with my first two books, I never aspired to. I use them only as a tool to get new clients, but I see the benefit. There are so many different ways to use your book as a marketing tool. And again, this is another topic in the book. Based on that, what's the most effective book marketing tool you've ever seen? Oh, wow. You know, it really depends on your audience and the genre of your book. I happen to think that if you're selling fiction books, things like BookBub, where people will, you know, get your book into the inboxes and Kindles of thousands of readers all at once for a discounted price can be really smart. You can go from selling, you know, dozens of books to selling thousands of books. For business and nonfiction authors, and which is really sort of more my expertise and more who we serve and the publishing side of our business. It really is about, I think the best thing you can do to sell books is to be, it comes back to that, be known, be seen. So our authors who sell a ton of books step onto a lot of stages. I spend a lot of time talking to people about going sort of from the page to the stage and back again. And there is this really beautiful virtuous cycle between standing up in front of audiences. And you can do that even during a pandemic and do it virtually, you know, it's not unheard of to have a, to be a guest on a podcast where or on a webinar or, you know, a panel discussion where there are hundreds or thousands of people logging in and figuring out how to use that as an opportunity to promote your book or to get people excited about your topic so that they'll want to learn more to go buy your book. Also being unafraid to be known outside of your area geographically is really key. So American authors, for example, who only have clients in the United States are really limiting how many books they can sell. But if you're not afraid to give a presentation in Singapore and one in Australia and one in Japan, suddenly you become known around the world and your ability to sell books increases exponentially. So obviously, uh, cost per click advertising works really, really well. So I do think that book authors ought to be investing in Amazon ads as well as Facebook ads can be really great as well. If you're not willing to spend money to promote your own book, why should people be willing to spend money to buy your book? So it really is, I I feel very, very strongly when it comes to being an author, we no longer live in that day, you know, when Random House writes you a big check and says, we'll make sure your book is a success. You know, there are millions and millions of books out there. 
And it's your job, not just to write a great book, but to become a really great author and to promote the book yourself. And there is no such thing as return on investment without first investment. This is the perfect time if you choose to write a book to think like a marketer, because you have to market and promote your book. But what about the person who's listening to the show right now? And I know there are going to be a lot of them who says, you know what? I don't care about selling lots of books. I'm writing my book so that I can use it as a marketing tool to get new clients. Any thoughts on that? Any particular strategy that like pops into your mind? You're like, hey, you definitely want to do this because this is killer. Yeah, this will work. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great it's a great question, Ken, because the vast majority of money that you are going to make off of publishing a book does not come from book royalties. It's not about selling the book. I mean, that's almost sort of secondary. So it really is about being able to raise your consulting fees. It's about being able to get booked for more gigs, more speaking engagements, etc. So one of the first things that you have to do when you release a new book is you need to start acting like an author. So it's about really sort of positioning yourself to be findable and follow worthy on social media is a really good thing to do. So if you're going to put the name Kate Colbert on the cover of a book, you can't go be Kathleen Colbert on Twitter and Kathy Colbert somewhere else or something else sort of cute or you know, dog mom or something. You have to stick to your brand and be findable so that when people want to talk about you or your book or your services, they know how to tag you. And it's also really about... I love the question you asked because it's about clarity, about understanding what am I trying to accomplish with this book? And if it is essentially a leave behind for you, if it is sort of a one pound business card, how do you think about using that? So if you have X number of meetings coming up, or you're going to be doing training work, or you're an attorney or a doctor, you've got people coming in and out of your office, does everybody get a copy when they check in for their appointment? Do you give an autographed copy during every first initial conversation? If you're a consultant, do your clients get a free guided book club of your book at sort of an added value where they can bring other people in and you, at, at no cost or at low cost? And the other thing too is remember, every time you have an audience, whether it's 50 people or a thousand people in an audience, if you speak for the right audiences and you speak in front of audiences that have decision-making authority, and by the way, I only speak in front of people who I think could become customers, unless it's something sort of fun and pro bono, like speaking at one of my undergrad alma maters, for example. I don't say yes to every speaking opportunity because the idea is, again, getting up on that stage, that's the sample. And having them buy the book at the back of the room is endearing them to you. But ultimately, it's not about the $20 book. It's about, might they pay you several thousand dollars to come do some consulting for their business? So it comes back to that, be known, be seen. And I do think that it does have to be a really quality book. We do have happen to live in a day and age where it's easier and easier to publish. And so we have to be really careful not to uh, rush to failure, as they say, I think that in the army... So trying to get books out too fast, it really is about writing the best work. And I will say this, I wrote my book for the readers, but I also wrote it for myself because I found that I was giving the same lessons and providing the same sort of value add consulting over and over again. And I thought I could write this down. And now the book is the sample to my consulting services. So just yesterday, somebody reached out to me and said, I just finished reading your book. What's your consulting rate? And they reached out on LinkedIn. And so that's for me... It is the... You talked about lead magnets. For me, the book is the lead magnet to the consulting. I wouldn't expect anyone to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for the type of work that I do if they hadn't read my book and they weren't confident that I am what I say I am. I'm going to follow up with something you just said. You said you wrote the book in part for yourself. So what I'd like to know is, how has writing the book Think Like a Marketer made you a better marketer? Well, I don't like to be a hypocrite. So the book, you know, I think there really is something about that putting your money where your mouth is, or, you know, they, they, people joke about the, you know, sort of the cobbler's children having no shoes and sort of the irony of that. I don't ever want to be guilty of that. So I try to think about what would I tell my clients? What did I say in chapter six? What did I say in chapter nine? And try to think of my business and my brands as my most important client. And think of myself as a reader. I actually do pick up my... I keep my book laying on my desk at all times with a beautiful coordinating leather bookmark that holds my book open. And I've got little scribbles and post-it notes all over my book all the time. My book is essentially my business playbook. So if I were to think about this as sort of a sports competition, 
I go back to the book all the time to see, you know, what are the strategies I tell everybody else and how can I be doing a better job to employ that? And I do really live and die by the five principles of the book. Okay. And so with respect to marketing strategies, we just talked about book marketing, but I want to ask you kind of a follow-up question to that. Which strategy, if there is one that you covered in the book, that's not book marketing, because obviously writing this book has done fabulously well for you. What's the next best strategy for you personally that's helped bring in a ton of clients and help make you a ton of money that you'd list in the book? You know, for me, it really comes down to high touch strategies for high margin clients. So one of the things I talk about in the book, and it's one of the five principles of thinking like a marketer, is marketing in a way that's what I call strategy religious and tactic agnostic meaning be really, really clear about your strategy and always drive to that when it comes to your marketing, but be willing to be a little bit flexible and try new things or abandon things on the tactical side, right? So I've had people come to me and say, Kate, we need to develop an app. And I would say, why? What's it going to do for your clients? Like, so you can't keep falling in love with sort of, you know, the latest and greatest sort of shiny object. You know, we're not rushing off to figure out how to use TikTok for business, right? we're taking a look at the strategy. For my business, my strategy really is about creating deep relationships and demystifying the work that I do to be incredibly honest and transparent and have a trusted relationship with my clients. In order to be able to do that, that means that I have to know which clients are the clients that deserve sort of the VIP treatment and which ones are sort of just on the general list. So my strategy really is about creating high touch opportunities for those VIPs who bring in lots of business and high margin business. So those are the people I take out to dinner. Those are the people I send holiday gifts. Those are the people who are getting personal phone calls and and sort of special samples and special love for me all the time. The folks who hire us once every three years, you know, for a $750 brochure design, they're on our email list. And we have to make those trade-offs because we have to take best care of sort of the VIPs and our customer family. And so that's the strategy that underpins our success. In terms of the tactics that work best, I would say they really change as consumer needs change and as consumers' consumption habits change. So video, you know, I would say being visible is really, really important. So I used to be terrified of video. I wouldn't produce them. I had nothing. I didn't like to get on a stage. I've struggled with my weight my entire life. And I was always very self-conscious about being seen. And when I finally got over myself and realized that's my issue and the, the audience, they need something from me. And when I was able to shift my mind to think about what is it that customers and prospective customers and audience members need from me and how can I give it to them? Once I put my heart on service to be able to serve them, it was impossible to be selfishly worried about whether or not my blouse looked right or, you know, if people thought I looked too fat or what have you. So really sort of putting your customer first and everything you do will net you great results. That said, I want to give a caveat since we talked about sampling, you do have to balance it. So while you can give some things away, you can't give everything away. You have to make your own cash register ring. I talk a lot of it in the book about creating this virtuous cycle between creating value for your constituents and capturing value back to the bottom line. And you have to do both and you have to do them in balance. If you create tons and tons of value, right? So you do three podcasts a week and tons of really cool blog posts and you're putting cool stuff out there and you have a newsletter and what have you, but you're not charging people for much. You're going to burn out. You're going to give up. Your business is going to fail. You have to capture enough. On the reverse side... If you don't give away much value, but you're just constantly sending out emails, you know, sidewalk sale this Saturday, or, you know, buy now or book now, or do this, do, and you're constantly saying, buy, 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 buy my stuff, customers get really sick and tired of that. They want you to communicate with them for connection and meaning. They want you to provide value. They're happy to give you value back, um, but it has to feel like an equal exchange to them. So that's one of the things we're constantly looking at here is do we have that imbalance? And I would say almost on a daily basis, we're making adjustments to figure out whether we need to be offering more value or capturing more value because it's a difficult and important dance. You know, I'm a big fan in the right circumstance in the right setting of networking. And your book came out before COVID came on the scene. Thank you, China. One of the things you talked about in the book that I really, really enjoyed 
and I wanted to get your thoughts on this. This is more of a personal question for me, but you talked about the future of networking. And so what I'd like to know is based on the fact now that when you wrote the book, you didn't know that COVID was going to disrupt everything. Now that it has, have your thoughts about the future of networking changed? And if they have, how so? Yeah, I would say they have changed a little bit. So, you know, I never imagined um, where we would be right now. And I do believe that as more and more of us attend really great networking and conference events that are being done virtually and that we're finding it valuable, fewer and fewer people are going to come back to the face-to-face conferences in the future. So I do think that we have to be thinking about... So I I just recently participated for a, a couple of days in the Global Leadership Forum, and it was wonderful, but there really weren't networking opportunities. So I learned a ton and I didn't have to get on an airplane. But I wasn't able to advance my business in terms of relationship generation, shaking hands, taking people out to lunch, being known and being seen. I was able to get great ideas that I could execute for the future. But I felt like I only got 50% of the experience. And it was an outstanding conference and done incredibly well. I mean, they had live music and it felt as close to being there as it possibly could have been. So I think that we're going to have to shift. Now, what I would say is, because people are going to get more streamlined and saying, well, if this conference in the future is offered in a hybrid fashion, why would I take four days away from work, fly to Dallas, spend all this money in a hotel and go? I would say that my prediction now is that as audiences will get smaller and smaller at conferences, the opportunity for attending is actually better than it's ever been. Especially when you're looking to sort of shake hands and talk to people who might be really well known in the industry or the space you're attending for, sort of famous people, keynote speakers, they'll have more time to talk to you. They'll have more time to, you know, chit chat and get to know you while they're signing a book or what have you. So I think that as those audiences get smaller, I, in fact, I think back, this is a strange story, Ken, but I think back to 9 11. So here's, here's sort of two mass casualty events, right? 9 11 and, and COVID. And right after 9 11, I was, st- I was working in the magazine industry covering the semiconductor profession. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time hanging out with tech companies. And, and a couple of weeks after 9 11, there was a huge conference in Baltimore. And very few people felt comfortable, and very few people's spouses and kids felt comfortable with them getting on an airplane right after those hijackings. And so I went and I showed up. And I was one of very few people who showed up. And what that meant was I was able to have amazing conversations. I ultimately had a conversation with a gentleman next to an escalator. We stood and talked for 45 minutes. He told me some trade secrets for his company, shared information he never would have shared if he'd been in a rush. And if I'd been in a rush and hadn't had time to listen. And as a result of that, I was actually the first journalist in the world to break the story about the invention of Bluetooth technology. Yeah. So here I am sitting with my Bluetooth headset on. And so there are huge opportunities of being very visible at a conference that has a smaller number of attendees. So I would say they will become more valuable in the future as long as conference organizers continue to put together really great content in the future. So enjoy the virtual stuff while you can. But once it's safe and viable to be getting back out there, I say, get your butt back out there. You know, another important topic that you talked about in the book was self-promotion. And I really, really enjoyed that. Most of it I knew, but I'm an advanced marketer. But I will say that it stirred up some things in my mind that I'd literally forgotten about. So that in and of itself was tremendously valuable for me. But what self-promotion strategy is on the verge, if there is one, of literally exploding? There's a strategy of self-promotion that someone can use. It's just like going to, bam, it's going to hit and it's going to explode here very soon. Oh, gosh. I don't, you know, I'm not, as much as I do give a lot of predictions in the book, I I would say I'm not a diehard futurist, but I I will say that I think digital platforms that are very successful, but that have limitations are very interesting to me right now. So Instagram is one that's fantastic for branding, but in your individual posts, you can't put a link, right? So you can generate awareness and interest, but it's very, very difficult to generate some sort of transaction on Instagram. We have learned over the years from LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and other platforms that the functionality of these platforms changes over time and expands based on customer demand. So do I think that Instagram, for example, might become really valuable for businesses beyond branding, but for actual direct marketing and transaction? Yes, I think so. So I think that it's going to be important um, to be there and to have a following. 
I also think that, again, having a really smart story is going to be really important. Again, coming back to this, you know, you're not just that a really great comedian. You're not just a really great business consultant. You are the comedian who, you're the business consultant who. So can people parrot your story back? I think being really clear and being relentless about how you articulate your meaningful difference and articulate your story will put you ahead. But in terms of what channel I think is really going to make it possible, I do think that, you know, people are, we get tired of stuff. I actually have been thrilled how podcasts have continued to grow in popularity and staying power. I think early on as a marketer, I fell in love with them, but I thought people will get lazy. And I think they do. You know, I think that people sometimes listen to the first 10 minutes of an interview and then they bounce out. So I think it will be important as we go forward to be paying attention to that short attention span. So if you're producing content that's 45 minutes, if you're producing, you're writing long articles, et cetera, how do you make sure... It's almost the sampling strategy, right? How do you make sure you give away something wow and leave an impression on the customer in the first 50 words, in the first five minutes, et cetera, so that if you do lose them, it's the same sort of strategy for the fact that the vast majority of social media videos these days are being played with the volume off. So does your video make sense without volume? Does your video make sense? You know, can you put captions over it? So how do we be thinking about the overscheduled, busy, and potentially lazy consumer? And how do you use that to your benefit or at least not let it hurt you? All right. So I'm going to ask you a question on the flip side of that that just popped into my head. What marketing strategy is slowing down or dying? So that is an interesting one. I think email marketing is more difficult than it used to be because people have too much email in their inbox. And so while email marketing is vital and I think important for most brands, I think it doesn't deliver in the way that it used to because of this sort of abundance of messaging that you're competing against. I also think that as much as I love it, and I've had the opportunity to write and produce some really great television and radio commercials in our day, I think that television commercials are not generating in the way that they used to because so many of us are watching our television sort of DVR'd and we're fast forwarding. So I think a lot of traditional marketing is not working the way that was. But in most cases, there's a viable alternative. So I see our customers and and I advise our, our clients to be spending a whole lot more attention on the advertising and awareness they create on streaming radio, for example, Pandora and Spotify versus broadcast radio. Similar things with television. You know, is it better to be visible on YouTube as an advertiser than on NBC or CNN? And so I think that much of traditional marketing is getting people really want a digest version. They want to fast forward through it. They want to bite size. And what they end up taking the bite out and sort of leaving on the table is the advertising. And so for marketers and promoters, they've got to be thinking about new ways to go where the customers are. And unfortunately, the customers aren't watching a whole lot of live television or listening to a whole lot of broadcast radio. Interestingly, direct mail actually is something that people think of as old school. And it's actually more impactful now than it's ever been. Absolutely. Mean old Dan was right. Yeah. Mean old Dan was right. He told us it will never die. And he was right, at least in his lifetime. I got one question for you. And then I want to talk about the stuff you're working on your business, how people can get in contact with you, find out more about you. What's the one question today that I didn't ask that I should have asked you? Oh, boy, that is a tough one. Well, I think I think you should ask me about what the five principles are of, of thinking like a marketer so that people can get started on doing that, even without having read the book. Kate, I just came up with this brilliant question out of thin air in the ether. It just came to me. What was the question again? What are the five? (laughs) Go ahead and answer it. Yeah. So thinking like a marketer really comes down to five principles. And you can start putting these to work right away, even before you've dug into the book. But here you go. Principle number one is communicate for connection and meaning, not just to transact sales. Meaning... Be available, be talking to your customers, sending out interesting information, blog posts, ahas, cool stuff, fun stuff on social media, interesting pictures. If they only hear from you when you're saying, buy now, buy now, buy now, they're eventually going to say, buy now, and it's going to be BYE, and they're going to be disappearing on you. So that's principle number one. Principle number two, live and die by your customer insights. 
If you haven't done a client survey recently, you haven't done focus groups, you haven't looked at data from your competitors, you haven't swum around in the data on your own website metrics, you need to be doing that because the answers to how much should I charge, who should I focus on, who cares about me, who loves me, who's willing to refer to me, all of those things you wish you knew are knowable. In fact, we do some work with our clients where we ask them to do what we call the ellipsis test. We say, fill in the dot, dot, dot for us in this sentence. If we only knew dot, dot, dot about our customers, we would be wildly successful. If we only knew dot, dot, dot about our customers, I would be able to sleep better at night. What is that dot, dot, dot? So do you want to know, is the product that you're selling targeting to female customers actually more desired by male customers and is your marketing strategy off? Do you want to know, would people be more likely to pay $129 than $99 for that service? We have found that whatever is in that dot, dot, dot that our customers want to know, and we make our clients, by the way, make us wish lists. What do you wish? What do you think you knew about? What do you think you know about your clients, your customers? And what do you wish you knew? We find that 85% of that wish list of that dot, dot, dot is knowable. So go get that information and then adjust your business strategies based on what you find out. Principle number three is market in a way that's strategy, religious, and tactic agnostic. We talked about that earlier today. Figure out what the right strategy is for your marketing and then be religiously focused on it, but be willing to be malleable and flexible and agnostic when it comes to the tactics so that if something cool comes along, right, whatever that next thing is other than Instagram or Pinterest or whatever, be willing to try it if it makes sense, if it serves the strategy. And if something is cool that you love doing, whether it's direct mail or email marketing or whatever, if it's not serving your strategy, let it go. Principle number four is create cultures and processes that align with your brand. So try to be the kind of company, for example, you know, be a Southwest Airlines. So if you have a brand that says that we're all about convenience, we're all about friendliness, et cetera, make sure that you are giving the authority to your employees to be able to make smart decisions, right? So be, you know, create cultures and processes that align with the brand that you put out to the marketplace. And number five, uh, think like a marketer principle is to do everything in service of maintaining that virtuous cycle of creating value for the customer while capturing value for you. You can only stay in business if you keep that in balance. So keep balancing. What do you give away? Where are your value adds versus how do you monetize and how do you charge the right fees and attract the right customers and keep that cycle running? Great value, capture value. And that's really what it takes to think like a marketer. I have to ask this question. I have to. I said it was my last question, but I have to ask this question. So principle number two, you talked about the ellipses test. Yeah. What about the listener who's listening and they have zero clients right now? They've lost. Let's just imagine if they lost, they could probably go back and pull those people. But let's pretend they're starting a new business and they're not sure how to answer those questions. What strategy, tool, or tactic could you recommend for them so they could find out as much data about their ideal or perfect prospect moving forward? Yeah, great question. So there are always lookalike customers for the people you're thinking you want to attract. So if you say, my expertise is X, Y, and Z, and here's the kind of services I can provide, you can always go to the marketplace and find out, you know, would, you know, if such a product or service existed and it looked like X, would you be willing to buy it? How much would you be willing to pay for it? Give them, you know, sort of price categories. So you don't have to have your own customers to be able to do marketing research. You can go find customers. In fact, we did a study for a elite top 50 um, national research university a couple of years ago. And we wanted to understand what juniors and seniors from sort of high talent, high income families were looking for in a college. And we didn't want to just look at the folks who had already applied to that university. So we went out to the marketplace and we talked to thousands of students and parents, and they're really easy to find. And with tools, there are a lot of great market research tools, but even with platforms, we were able to get tons and tons of participants in focus groups and uh, online surveys by reaching out on Facebook. So customers are out there. They might not be your customer yet, but if you know how to say, uh, how to identify them, you know, hey, so-and-so, if you're interested in XYZ, or if you're 18 to 25, or what have you, start asking them questions And take a look to see if there's data out there that somebody else has done. Go to websites like Pew Research or the Census Bureau or what have you and find out, is there interesting data out there that already exists that could help inform smart decisions for you to either start a company or for you to restart your company? What's the best place or best way for us to get your book, Think Like a Marketer? And what's your website URL? And 
Tell us about your business, any coaching programs you have, what's going on? What do we have? So the book, Think Like a Marketer, How a Shift in Mindset Can Change Everything for Your Business is available on Amazon and elsewhere in paperback, uh, Kindle edition and audiobook. So go find me on Amazon, learn more about me and keep in touch at katecolbert.com. And in terms of what we're doing these days, um, where we can continue to help and add value to you is really on that data-driven differentiation side. So if you are doing the ellipsis test and you want to figure out how to change your strategy, how to find more clients, how to keep more clients, how to get more share of wallet from your existing clients, getting at that data and then figuring out what those insights are to drive your strategy and help you make smart decisions, that's what I'm best known for these days. If you are launching a business or it's time for you to rethink the way you talk about your business to the marketplace in terms of the story that you tell about your brand, and strategic storytelling is the other sort of half of the magic that we produce here. So if you want to be more successful, whether your business is 50 years old, 5 years old, or just an idea, starting a conversation with me would be a great place to start. And so Colbert is spelled with a C, not a K. So K-A-T-E-C-O-L-B-E-R-T dot com. Correct. Yes? Yes. All right, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Kate, you did an awesome job with the interview today. And I know you delivered value, not only for me, but for the person listening to the show today. They're going to get a lot out of it. And I just want to thank you for investing the time to be with us today. Any last thoughts before we wrap it up? You know, my last thoughts are anybody who is listening, my hat is off to you. Running a business or working in leadership at any business, any size in any industry is hard and being at your sharpest on the top of your game requires energy every single day. So keep doing the hard work. Keep figuring out what pays off, um, what you can say yes to, what you can say no to. I really appreciate you. I hope you'll take the time to think like a marketer and I look forward to hearing the results that you'll have. After listening to my conversation with Kate Colbert today, I hope you recognize the need to expand and improve your marketing strategy and that you can appreciate and have embraced the importance of thinking like a marketer and how that can totally transform the success and profitability of your business. Knowing, understanding, and empathizing with the new challenges and concerns your perfect prospects and clients face, and knowing how to adjust your marketing messaging successfully so you can bring your business through the new COVID economy and get it back on track and make it more profitable and successful by knowing how to get clients now is your goal. Being able to cut through the clutter and noise that runs rampant in the new coronavirus economy so you can create messaging that is magnetic and irresistible to your prospects and clients is all about being able to think like a marketer. And by doing so, you can discover and recognize the challenges and concerns your clients now face. By having a clear and accurate picture of your client's circumstances, you can more easily utilize and deploy the right strategies and tactics, allowing you to get clients now. If today's episode has gotten you thinking about ways you can think like a marketer, thinking about ways you can create new and effective marketing campaigns and messaging, strategies that are magnetic and irresistible to your perfect prospects and clients, let me quickly mention several past episodes that are a great complement to today's conversation. The first one you'll find especially helpful is episode 377. Could this really be the most effective method you can use to acquire new clients and make sales virtually in the COVID-19 era? Patrick Galvin, CEO of the Galvanizing Group and bestselling author of The Connector's Way says, yes. You know, one of the important aspects of thinking like a marketer involves understanding and being able to communicate with prospects and clients more effectively so your marketing messages become magnetic and resonate with your prospects. And when you can do that, you'll generate immediate sales and increased profit in your business, as we talked about in today's conversation. You'll find that much of what Patrick Galvin and I talked about on episode 377 dovetails perfectly with the strategies you heard today in my conversation with Kate Colbert in episode 377 the perfect complement to today's conversation. I'd also recommend episode 376, where social media marketing and best-selling author Neil Schaefer reveals how to attract new clients faster and cheaper using influencer marketing. You know, as business models and buyer behavior morphed in response to changes in the new COVID economy, being able to think like a marketer and establish working, profitable relationships with key influencers in your niche, in your marketplace, becomes more valuable, not less episode 376 for that. And then finally, I couldn't talk about maximizing the effectiveness of your marketing strategy and campaigns without mentioning the framework for virtual selling I covered, covered it solo on episode 373, the ultimate system for virtual selling and winning presentations, the Arise framework, the virtual selling system that works even better in a bad economy. 
You know, when you think like a marketer, your marketing campaigns will automatically become more effective and generate more sales opportunities for your business. The Arise Framework is a virtual sales system for increasing sales conversions consistently. A virtual sales system, like I mentioned, that works even better in the new COVID economy. So improving the effectiveness of your marketing and sales systems are going to be vital to the success of your business into the foreseeable future, as I talked about in today's conversation. Episode 373, a great compliment to today's conversation as well. All of those past episodes you can find on our website at www.kennewhouse.com. And before wrapping up, I want to quickly mention that we're in the process of creating a free membership for you where you'll be able to access the entire library of conversations searchable by topic since 2017. And when you decide to become a member on kennewhouse.com, you'll have instant access to my own personal library, the notes from other books that I've featured on the show for the last few years, plus access to a weekly strategy guide that will come in your inbox every Wednesday. The guide will feature all the links we mentioned on every show that links to books, resources, also other podcast episodes, as well as the most effective strategy we covered on that week's episode. Additionally, the guide will contain other articles that I found online that I know will be useful to you as well. So be sure to look for the announcement when we launch the new free membership portal we're creating for you on KenNewhouse.com. And in addition to all that I've mentioned, the first 500 subscribers will get a free digital copy of the updated version of my book, Profitable Again, as well as a copy of my newest book, Profitable Podcast Blueprint, 100% free. Speaking of world-class marketing strategists, Matt Clark is my guest next week. Clark is the CEO of The Virtual Edge and co-creator of The Rainmaker, a system that consistently generates new high value, not low value, not average value, high value new clients from LinkedIn. Clark has become known around the world as one of the leading LinkedIn marketers who ascended to the top after building and then selling one of the most successful sales companies in all of South Africa. So if you'd like to learn how to attract and convert high value prospects from LinkedIn into paying clients without spamming people and without using high pressure sales tactics, be sure to join me for a conversation with Matt Clark next week. Have a great week, enjoy your weekend, and I'll see you next Monday. Take care. Our objective with this podcast is to help you and your business stand out in the marketplace by crystallizing your messaging, marketing, and communications. On behalf of the whole Ken Newhouse team, thanks for listening.